Americans must really want to avoid pain. Really want to try to just keep from experiencing it. Look at the amount of prescription medication that Americans take each year. More than a quarter of Americans suffer daily pain, a condition that costs the US about $60 billion a year in lost productivity. Did you know that Americans consume 80% of the world's supply of painkillers? Let me say that again. Wow. Americans, less than 5% of the world population, consume 80%. This is more than the wealth we consume. Okay? We consume 80% of the world's supply of painkillers. More than 110 tons of pure addictive opiates every year. And quoting from, I believe it was Christianity Today, or excuse me, Time Magazine, it went on to say, as the country's prescription drug abuse epidemic explodes, we continue to take more. Did you know that that's enough drugs to give every single American 64 Percocets or 64 Vicodins? What do we all need with 64 Vicodin? Every single one of us, from baby to the grave, that's, that's enough for every single one of us. Did you also know that drug abuse leads to 14,800 deaths a year. That's more, this is from prescription medicine, that's more than from heroin and cocaine combined. Vicodin, Percotex. Hmm. Now, some of you are saying, and Shauna's sitting back there, yeah, but Pastor Bill, Daryl is really hurting. And he is, right? Have any of you had a knee replacement? No one? Okay, well, Daryl has. And then they rebuilt, reconstructed all kinds of things in here. Kind of moved his kneecap away, put some other pizzas inside there, drilled some screws in, and it really, 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 really hurts. That's on top of the pain he was already feeling for, for years of damage to that knee. He's got arthritis as well in there. So, so am I saying right now that Daryl shouldn't be taking pain medication? I'm saying the other 63 of us don't maybe need it. He does. <laughs> okay, just, just think about it. Don't we all want to avoid pain? I mean, how many of you say, I can't wait to go to the dentist? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of synonymous with some pain, isn't it? <laughs> we were sharing this week, uh, and people were talking about one of the things that they wanted to do, that, that, they, that they, an appointment they missed. Guess what? was the appointment at the dentist. I think that was the one that was stated the most. <laughs> because the, we want to avoid pain. And in America especially, we have this kind of mentality. And the, maybe what's happening is in the process, we're becoming just a little bit soft. <laughs> maybe just a little bit. <laughs> we all want to avoid pain. Christ wanted to avoid pain. What did it take for heaven to say, we're going to leave the splendor of this place and we're going to go and place ourselves in a human body and that body is going to feel temptation. It's going to feel what it's like to have sin around you. It's going to feel what it's like to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be afraid, to be broken, to be discouraged and eventually to be torn apart, tortured, and then to feel sin. What did it take for heaven to go on that journey?
couple passages we're going to look at this morning are from Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6 through 11, and then Isaiah 53. They, they work together as we try to uh, continue to move towards Easter. And, and we're in this series in which we've been looking at the, the movie Risen. By the way, again, how many of you have seen that now? They'll raise them high so I can really see how many. Okay. So the rest of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about then, right? <laughs> the Risen movie. It's a movie about a Roman tribune who has the responsibility, first off, of overseeing the troops who will crucify Jesus Christ. Later, he is given the responsibility to go protect the body and again, his troops are responsible for protecting the body to make sure that nobody comes and takes the body. And then he gets the responsibility. Pilate sends him out and says, Tribune, you need to find the body. And they will dig up graves and all kinds of It gets nasty because they're looking for the body of the crucified one, Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, they never find it. But in the movie, now the movie, as you know, I mean, you can add things to a movie, right, beyond what's necessarily true, because, right, isn't that okay? And so Claudius actually sees Jesus, and he struggles with believing. How can, I saw, I saw you, I saw you die. I don't even know what to ask you, is his comment at one point. He sits down beside Jesus and says, I have no idea what to ask you. <laughs> that was probably his best statement, is to say nothing and ask nothing. Just sit there beside the risen Christ. What would that be like? Christ's pain. <coughs> his pain on the cross. His, <coughs> excuse me. His pain pain in dealing with sin, his pain in, as scripture says, becoming sin for us, actually buys our reconciliation. So look at Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Jesus paid for our reconciliation with his death. As he's going to the cross the night before, he says, okay, Father, I really, I really don't want to go through this. He's been with the disciples. He's spoken with them. He's asked them to stay awake and pray because he is, he's upset. And he wants their support. And he knows that they're in trouble too. And so he knows that prayer is the thing that they need most right now. And so he leaves them. It says, scripture says, Matthew 26, a second time. And he goes back and he kneels down and he prays again. And now he's crying out. He says, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, then may your will be done. It's interesting. That's at the heart of the prayer that he taught the disciples to pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What? Thy will be done. And Jesus now is praying that prayer again. Okay, Father, your will be done. Your will. Because I know this is the only way that we're going to be able to rescue humanity. This is the only way that we're going to be able to take care of them is that I have to die. Philippians said it this way, and being found in appearance as a man, 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. If you continue to read in Romans, it says that by one person, the sins of the, have entered the world, right? Adam makes his mistake and Eve, and because of that, we get the privilege of experiencing judgment and guilt and shame and all that kind of stuff. Temptation is real for all of us. This is just as one, by one person sin came into the world, then Paul goes on to say, but by one man, reconciliation, forgiveness comes by the death of that one man. For the next few moments, I want us to look at Isaiah 53. I want us to look at what the Old Testament said the Messiah would do. It, it might be interesting to note that the Jews did not think that they needed really to be forgiven. Hey, they're the blessed people. So, so it's interesting because what they thought they needed was they needed a sympathetic king. They didn't need a savior who would take their sins away and forgive them because, hey, we're already special. But they needed a king who would be sympathetic to their needs and concerned about them. But that's not true, is it? And Jesus comes to radically change the thinking of the Jews to say, you need a Messiah who will actually die for you. Isaiah 53 describes that Messiah. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to follow along. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Jesus comes as an infant, a tender shoot, unprotected, simply being born. And as you know, in a stable to a young woman who was a virgin, it's a tender shoot. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. It wasn't because, oh, wow, this is, he's a movie star. I mean, look how wonderful he, he he's, a, he's so gorgeous. That's why, the, no, no, it was nothing about his looks that drew people to him. In fact, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man who understood hurt and pain and grief a man who felt the weight of people's despair. So as Jesus would walk around, he'd see somebody sick, and what would he do for them? He'd heal them. His compassion comes out. His understanding of sorrow comes out every time he's dealing with a parent who's saying, please help my child. The father who comes and says, my child is dying. Please help them. The woman who comes who's bleeding, who says, and she just wants to touch just his hem with the hope that somehow she'll be healed. Even Lazarus' sisters whose brother have died. Jesus is a man of sorrows. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. As Jesus hangs on the cross, the crowds will jeer, the crowds will holler at him. Ultimately, they'll simply all walk away. And the world, but not just the world, the Father will reject the Son as He hangs and dies there on that cross. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Surely He was one who cared about us. Surely He was compassionate, kind, and tender-hearted. This is Jesus Christ who healed thousands, who, who fed thousands, who took care of all kinds of people. And as He hangs there and dies, He's rejected. Yet we considered Him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. If you are the son of God, 
if you are the Son of God. Call down the angels from heaven and come down off of that cross. If you are our Messiah, save yourself like you've saved others. Show us your power. Oh my. Despised by those who should have welcomed him. This is Isaiah 53. 700 years before the cross. But he was pierced for our transgression. And they took him out to the mount called Golgotha, to the place of the skull. And there next to two thieves who deserved to die, they took nails and they pierced his hands. And then they pierced his ankle for us. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. As he's hanging there on the cross. And he remembers some of the things that he had said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He looks out and he sees the people who have been there, who have, the ones who have put him on that cross, the ones who have cried out, crucify him, the ones who have said, we'd rather have a thief named Barabbas than to have Jesus Messiah. And as he's weakening, my God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, Sabachthani, why, why have you forsaken me? He cries. Why? He knows. Because sin is invading his whole body. Sin of the world is becoming his. And God his father is turning his back on him. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we are healed. And, and, and just, just be sensitive to this, this phrase here. Because what is the most important wound that you have? Yeah, if you go over to see Daryl, you'll see that he's got um, a sizable incision there, stapled, it was stapled together. <laughs> so he's got a wound that needs healing. But what is the wound that's deeper? It's the wound of our soul. The fact is that there is no way to go to heaven without having your soul healed. That hell is the result for anyone who doesn't want God. And that that should break our hearts. And it should move us also to believe and realize it's by His wounds that we get healed of that which causes our death. By his wounds, we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. They punched him. They beat him. They put this thorn of a crown around his head. And just imagine that, the, the pain of that, the, the, the headache that he got, the, the agony as they're doing all this to him. And what does he do? He says nothing. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And Jesus goes to the cross innocent. He doesn't have to be there. He's there by his own choosing. And like the lamb that will be slaughtered innocently, not even necessarily, he knows. And yet he remains silent. 
by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He'd been arrested and he had done nothing. He'd made himself available every single day, even in the temple courts. They could have come to him there, but no, they've got to go to him at night, in the dark, when they try to hide what they're doing. When deceitfully they will ask for others to make lies about him, and none of those will result in his being found guilty. The only thing that will find him guilty is the one thing that he says that is the truth. Are you the Messiah? The high priest asks, I adjure you in the name of God, you must answer this. And Jesus, in the name of God, answers, I am. And he uses the Yahweh name. He uses the name that's above every name. He says, yes, you have said it is, and I am that one. I am the Messiah. Yes, I am. Surely, the, the high priest says, this, you've heard it now. It's blasphemy. And if he's not the Son of God, it is blasphemy. And he's judged for being who he says he is. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. It's interesting I, how Isaiah is using this here because Isaiah is speaking prophetically, right? And, and he's saying that he's cut off. What does it mean? He dies. The servant of God dies. Cut off from the land of the living. Why? For the transgression, for the sins, for all the imperfection of every single one of us. And he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Where is Jesus buried? In a rich man's tomb. He doesn't even have a place. And yet, a rich man in, in, in the caves there where other wicked people die, he, he's buried with them. And, and though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, he had not lied. He had spoken the truth. He even said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. We can get upset at the Romans, or we can get upset at the Jews. We can get, get upset at the Pharisees and the religious leaders, but the bottom line is it was God the Father who crushes Jesus. My God, my God, why? And into your hands, I commend my spirit. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. <coughs> And what we have here is in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, in a, in a verse that is written to the people in exile, he says, look, there's going to be resurrection. He's going to come back to life. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Father, it's finished. And Jesus takes that final breath before he finishes paying the price for our sin. And his work is done. Therefore, Father God speaking, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And where is Jesus right now? Interceding in heaven, the high priest interceding on our behalf. You see, Christ's suffering was God's will, wasn't it? Christ's suffering was the plan that God had in order to set us free. 
Luke 9, 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That's Luke 9. That's early in the ministry. This is what has to happen. What did we see again? Let's back up in Isaiah one more time. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, get this, it was the Lord's the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. We, you and I, are healed by Jesus' pain. <laughs> Thank God we don't have to go through the pain. We are healed by his pain. He receives the punishment that you and I deserve. He takes the punishment for the whole world. First Peter says it this way, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. This quote from Isaiah 53. And when they hurled their insults at him, Peter says, he did not retaliate. Peter was there in that courtyard watching as they beat him, and he said nothing back. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Into your hands, Father, I command my spirit. It's your will, Father. And if this is the way for us to save them, then your will be done, Father. Verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Peter goes on in the third chapter, verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And then in chapter four, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And suffering is a key to coming closer to God, Peter says. Here's our problem. Our sin. Our sin was put on Jesus. My sin. The sins, not the only the ones I committed before I came to know Jesus, but the sins I've committed since. My sins, the sins I committed this week, are on Jesus. Your sin, your sin is on Jesus. The last few weeks we said, all of us have denied him. You denied him some way this week, and that sin is on Jesus. The sin, not just of us here, but the sins of the world are on Jesus. John MacArthur said, when Jesus died on the cross, he was being executed as a criminal. Had he committed any crime? No. Was he guilty of any wrongdoing? These are not trick questions, folks. No. Did he ever have an evil thought? No. Did he ever say an evil word? No. Some of you need to start shaking your head this way. Was it an unjust execution? See, you thought almost got you tricked into doing this. <laughs> yes, it was an unjust execution. Now, what then do we learn from it? 
Jesus shows us that a person can be in the, well, listen carefully, a person can be in the will of God because he was. A person can be greatly, eminently gifted by God for ministry because Jesus was. A person can be beloved of God because Jesus was. A person can be perfectly righteous. Jesus was. A person can be totally obedient to God in everything. Jesus was. A person can believe God perfectly and yet suffer. Because Jesus did. And he suffered unjustly. And now I'm quoting again from MacArthur. And his suffering was unjust. He was misunderstood. He was misrepresented. He was hated. He was persecuted. He was murdered. And what is the point? Christ in his death gives us the standard of how to respond to unjust persecution. He is the epitome of illustrations. It is possible to be perfect and still suffer. Jesus did. Are you letting that sink in? It's, it's possible to be perfect and still suffer. He didn't say he would take us out of this world or that we wouldn't suffer, that we wouldn't be in pain, that we wouldn't go through heartache and difficulty. But what he promised was to be there with us. Are you in pain today? <laughs> or have you taken your medication so you don't feel it? <laughs> are, are, are you in pain today? C.S. Lewis made a great statement. He says, God whispers in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. He goes on to say, it is his megaphone for rousing a deaf world. Are you in pain then what does Jesus want to say to you? What's Jesus trying to say to you in your pain? By the way, your neighbor doesn't know. God knows. What is Jesus trying to say to you? In whatever pain you're feeling, experiencing right now, what's Jesus trying to tell you? Laura Story has written a song called Blessings, and I think we've used it a couple of times here. It says, Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise? What is Jesus trying to say to you in the pain you might be going through? One thing I know, and he probably doesn't say it, but he understands. He knows. Sometimes we go up to somebody, oh, I know exactly how you're feeling. <laughs> Not a good thing to say. <laughs> because you don't. <laughs> no one knows exactly what someone else is feeling. Especially when they're going through something difficult or painful. No one, no one knows. You might have something similar. You may have pain and you can maybe relate that they're hurting. But no one knows. But Jesus does. And count on the fact that he went through horror, horror, because he loves you. 
horror for your sin. Horror. And it was the deepest, darkest pain that anyone could experience. And he doesn't downplay yours, but he does say, I care. And I died for your pain. <coughs> As we wrap up today, I want to ask you once again, who are your three? When we get to heaven, Revelation describes that at the end there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. Old things will pass away. All things become new. It's an incredible day. Heaven is unbelievable. And he says, this incredible statement then in Revelation 21, what is it? And it says, and he will wipe every tear from your eyes. And I can think of only one reason why we will cry in heaven. And I'm not talking about the, the tears of joy for being there. That's different. That's just, that's different. The, the tears of agony will be as we look over heaven and we'll see that there are people missing that we wanted there. Who are your three this week? Who are the three that if you got to heaven, if you went to heaven and you looked out and you saw and you said, oh, they're not here. Who would you weep over? And if you can't think of three people that you know who don't know Jesus, that it would break your heart, that you would start crying if you saw that they weren't there. If you can't think of three, then please start praying to care for somebody enough. And if all of the people you know, every single human being that you know is already a believer, then thank God for that. But pray that you would get to know a human who doesn't and that you'd love them enough that it would break your heart and you would cry in heaven. But be aware, while you'll be broken, he will wipe the tears away. And we sense from what scripture says, he'll wipe the memory as well. But I don't even want that moment to look out across the sea of faces and to see that somebody I love is not there. Who are your three? Who will you do something more for this week to share the fact that God died on a cross in order to set them free? Folks, there's nothing greater that you can give someone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you know if anyone sitting here today has not accepted the gift you paid for on the cross. You know if one of us are, has actually rejected you this week, God. You know if we've been given over more to sin than to you. You know all about us. You know the pain that some people are facing right now in this room. Heartache that is so deep and intense and it's influencing and affecting every part of their lives. You know the pain that's even deeper than the physical pain the emotional pain that, that some are facing. Jesus, I thank you that you care and you actually died to take that pain on your shoulders. You died to take our sin on your shoulders. You died for every single one of us here. And if anyone here has not said yes to you, I invite them to do that right now. To simply say, Yes, I accept what Jesus did for me on the cross. I may not understand it. It may still sound crazy. But I want what Jesus did for me, and I accept it. And if you, if you need to do that, just, just while there, while we're all praying, you just raise your hand to Jesus.
Have you thought of the three? I want you to think of them right now. And I'd like you to lift your hand with their names on your lips and you just kind of maybe imagine them there in your hand and you lift them up to Jesus right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving these people more than we do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross. Now help us to live believing it and different this week because you gave your life for us. Oh, Jesus, lead us to the cross as we go towards Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, please. And I believe the song is, Lead Us to the Cross. So let's make that our prayer, that we'd really be moved towards the cross as we come towards Resurrection Sunday. Please stand.